Today is 12-21-12. I was moved to make this uh, video study uh, about the divine throne, which brings the divine credentials. Because over the past 20 years or more, uh, there have been several individuals that have claimed uh, to be the leaders within the Branch, Davidian, and Seventh-day Adventist movements. Uh, especially in the Davidian movement, where they have vice presidents uh, that sit and basically act as presidents. But they say they're vice presidents. And we know that after Brother Hadif died, there had to be another uh, individual that was raised to lead out. And when that individual was called, there was a supernatural phenomenon that took place that indicated that he had the divine credentials. When he came to New Mount Carmel Center in 1959, the judicial throne accompanied him. It was seen over Mount Carmel. There was a similar occurrence in 1990 on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. There were some that were there looking for the throne to come, but it didn't come to pick them up. It actually came to bring the divine credentials to the anointed and appointed individual who was told to go there to greet the throne as it came down. I'm giving this study to point out to those that are making the claim to be the leaders, the Elijahs of today, that with this throne and with the appointment come the divine credentials for the individual that the Lord has anointed and appointed to do his work. And this is how you know who truly has the divine credentials and has, by the bylaws, been appointed. We're going to discuss the um, chronology of the um, chart that's in Merkab, the study that was given here um, back in um, 1993 about what took place within the uh, Advent movement basically during the Great Day of Atonement and I have a chart here um, labeled the Judgment and the Harvest the Great Day of Atonement and the top uh, section of it is the Judgment for the Dead and what I'm going to do is uh, basically go through the little uh, concise specific uh, points because most people have read um, about all this in the past okay but no one's been able to put it together and to see the chronology and the um, eschatology as the Lord has established it this has all been orchestrated by the Lord this is his plan his plan of the great day of atonement and the Great Day of Atonement is basically how the Lord is going to remove sin from off of the corporate body that represents him in the earth, his church, corporate body. And it was announced in 1833 by William Miller, the first day Adventists, that the um, cleansing of the sanctuary was going to begin. at the end of 2300 years or 2300 days days as a year and of course uh, there's been um, numerous uh, books written on this uh, you know it's all Adventist history okay so I don't need to get into the details there was a disappointment in 1833 or excuse me in 1844 because what they planned, you know, the Lord coming to the earth and cleansing it and taking the saints uh, 
didn't happen. And what they discovered was that the Lord went into went from the most from the holy into the most holy place in heaven, and um, they followed him in there, which meant that it was the beginning of the day of atonement, the day of cleansing, because that's the only day that he goes into that uh, most holy, and the holy become one. The veil's take, taken down, the outer door is closed, so you can't see in. Uh, but the veil in the temple is taken down, so the holy and the most holy apartments become one. And he began the investigative phase of the judgment, investigating the books of those that have been faithful or those that have claimed to be following Christ. And he looks through the books because the atonement is only for Israel. You have to understand that. It's not for the Gentiles. It's not for non-believers. It's for the 12 tribes of Israel. When they were basically surrounding the temple, the uh, tabernacle. And um, this had to do with their condition of that year. Did they, were they obeying the laws of God? Were they allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, lead them into all truth and convict them of sin? Because they had a visible presence in the tabernacle. They had a cloud by day and a fire by night. I mean, you can't get any closer than that. And if the Holy Spirit wasn't, the Shekinah wasn't appeased, well then, there was trouble in the camp. And the leaders had to get rid of the, of the sin that was in the camp. And the people had to understand they can't have sin in the camp. If they're sent in the camp, heads are going to roll. You understand? Holy God. And they had to realize that they were in the divine presence. And they were in the divine presence. Simple. So the investigative phase of the judgment came. And they learned that there was a Sabbath and sanctuary truth that needed to be um, adhered to. Now this is in 1844. And that was the investigative phase up until 18, from 1844 to 19, 1888 when the uh, message about the fourth angel came with Jones and Wagner. That was the um, end of the investigative phase because now another message comes and it's basically about that fourth angel that joins the third angel at the right time to give power and force and it was about the righteousness by faith righteousness by faith and righteousness by faith meant that you had to be in the faith. And uh, there was a lot of uh, um, um, information that was given by Jones and Wagner about our political um, um, position if we are believing in God okay, and in the Lord and in the Lord setting up his kingdom, then we can't have any other sovereigns over us. We have to be wholly given up to the Lord. And that's what Jones basically wrote about. Wagner wrote about the righteousness of Christ. How you receive the righteousness of Christ. And um, their message was rejected, ridiculed, and made fun of by the General Conference, the 1888 Conference of uh, in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And because they rejected this message, 
it says that they could have been in the kingdom by 1890 if they had have accepted the fourth member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, daughter. Not the Holy Spirit mother, but the Holy Spirit daughter. And at that time, they didn't know anything about it, of course. So the way the Lord was playing this, uh, you know, planning this whole thing, this eschatology, it began, he began the announcement of the judgment. And the judge, he judges the dead first and then the living. So this judgment for the dead began with the announcement of by William, William Miller that Ellen White brought the investigative phase. She brought a lot of truth about the Sabbath and the sanctuary. And that's what we started learning, you see. About then the judicial phase began in 1888. You have to have three phases to any judgment. Investigative, judicial, and then executive. The judicial is when they shoot, when they decide the verdict. And then the execution of that verdict is, it, verdict is the executive phase of the judgment. So in 1888, the judicial phase began. They could have been in the kingdom by 1890. So how were they judged? That was judgment against them. Because they didn't accept that message about the fourth member of the Godhead. So they couldn't go into the kingdom. Do you know why? Because the kingdom, just like that picture we have there, but with the tabernacle and everybody, uh, you know, encamped around, that was the kingdom. That's the kingdom. And we're told that the living spirit of prophecy is going to be revived and restored within our midst. That means the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, is going to be restored and be in our midst. We're going to have a cloud by day and a fire by night. But most uh, Adventists don't understand that. True worship is what you have there. The tabernacle, the wilderness tabernacle with a cloud by day and a fire by night, and a priesthood, and everyone's encamped around it. That's true worship. And that's what has to be restored to modern-day Israel. And Ellen White said that modern-day Israel is a Seventh-day Adventist movement. And she says, we are going to go through the same history of Israel. Because we're modern-day Israel. Well, you think about what they did. You think about them coming out of uh, you know Egypt and being 40 days in the wilderness and 40 years in the wilderness, excuse me, and uh, making their way to the kingdom and all the different things that happened to them with Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and, uh, uh, you know, on and on and on. We're going to have all those. Those were the types. We're going to have the anti-type. So I don't want to belabor it. I want to go through this really quickly and then we can start studying it uh, in detail. But today I just want to touch on uh, what this means. So we have the executive phase coming in 1930 with Brother Hodef. There was a 40 day, 40 year, um, uh, 40 years from the time of 1890 to 1930, wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because they rejected the truth about the kingdom. They couldn't be in the kingdom. So they wandered around in the wilderness. Ellen White died in 1915. We didn't have a prophet until 1929-1930. So the living spirit of prophecy was revived again after they were wandering in the wilderness. And, of course, 1930 to 1959 is the executive phase of the judgment. That's another 30 years, isn't it? 1959, 1960 is pretty close. Another 30 years. And you have to understand that the seals overlap. There's a 30-year lap, overlap. 
So, what happened in 1959? The, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement, Brother Hodov died. Florence Hodov took over. And in 1959, she made a prediction. Well, she made a prediction just after Brother Hodov died. And she assumed the leadership. And in four short years, which is about three and a half years. Now, if we're going all the way to uh, Passover of 1959, three and a half years before that brings you to what? And you come to three years before 1959 is 1956. Okay. Uh, and it would be 1950. Let's see, 1950, 56, 57, 58, and then 59. So, uh, um, and this was in the springtime of 59. Is anybody following me? Can you do the math, Simeon? What are the dates? Brother Hodov died in 19, uh, on February the 5th, I think it was, of 55. Okay. So three, it's not three and a half years from then. It's three and a half years from a year later. Because the, um, the association was in turmoil because they didn't have a president. They had to figure out who's in charge. Right? So, uh, 1959, the spring of 1959 at Passover time, Ben Roden came from Israel. And Ben Roden came from Jerusalem, from Mount Zion. I'm going to read it in context. In the words of Amos, who was among the the herdmen, now herdmen are shepherds, okay, of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay, so here we have, uh, it's telling you, it's defining the time. You have Judah and Israel. Okay? Two tribe Judah, ten tribe Israel. And Judah, Brother Hodder said, represents the leadership. And he felt that the Davidians were Judah. Is that correct, Simeon? So, we're looking at DSDA as Judah. And this is the... Um, the herdman, shepherd. This is a shepherd rod individual. You understand what I'm saying? This is her, it's, it's the shepherds, the herdman. Concerning them. And concerning Israel, SDA. Is that the right typology, uh, uh, Simeon? Have I got the typology right? SDA is Israel. And um, Judah is DSDA. Okay, so this is two years before the earthquake. Something's going to happen in two years, see? That's why I told you, uh, look at uh, 1955, okay, um, two short years, but the earthquake comes in 1959. <laughs> it shakes the association. Listen to what it said. And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn. They're going to be shaken. Mourn. 
then the top of Carmel shall wither. Now why are they mourning? Oh, Brother Hadif died. But another reason why they're mourning. See, they have no president. God gives them a president, but he comes, he sends them from Jerusalem and from Mount Zion, and he roars through that individual to these people who think that they have a leader, and it's Florence Hodov and an executive council. They took his place. Now, Brother Hodov, in September of 1954, wrote that they have a new program. It's a gospel program. What they're going to do is sell the excess and then the whole of the property. And he said, we're going to sell first the real uh, uh, prime real estate in the peach orchard. And then we're going to sell the rest of it. Because the Lord wants us to sell all that we have to buy the kingdom. And he says, And the kingdom is likened unto a man who finds a treasure in a field, and he hides it from anyone. He doesn't tell anyone that he found the treasure, and he found the field. And uh, he buys the field. But before he can buy the field, he sells all that he has to buy the field. Now, you know that field... Uh, the name, the word field in Hebrew is Carmel. Because Carmel is a fruitful field. So field in, in Hebrew is Carmel. So, Brother Hod have sold old Mount Carmel to buy new Mount Carmel. And yes, he died while that was going on. But I guarantee you, he left instruction with his wife to do it. Because she couldn't just take, uh, she couldn't take the funds, and according to the bylaws, only the president can sell and convey property, right? So he had to have something to do with this. And just because they can't find it, well, he hid it. So they couldn't find it. You understand? God hid it from everyone's view. And he bought New Mount Carmel Center. Now, they were there at New Mount Carmel Center for, uh, you know, years. For um, Brother Hodef dies in 55. By 1959, they're waiting for the chariot to come. So there was a three and a half year period where they had to move from Mount Carmel, sell it all, move from Mount Carmel, and come to New Mount Carmel. And be ready for the chariot, because that's what she believed. And she believed that he was selling it. Because he wrote in that, in that symbolic code, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sells all that he has and buys a field with a treasure in it. So what do you think she was thinking? The kingdom. And she knew that they had to go to Israel for the kingdom. Right? So she saw New Mount Carmel as a gathering place and they all thought it was for the 144,000 and they were thought there was going to be 144,000 people here and you know you got to gather the wave sheaf first before you gather the 144,000 so this executive phase of the judgment you see they're learning what Ellen White taught they investigated it then Jones and Wagner and Brother Hot, if I believe, was a repeat of Jones, Brother Jones' message about the kingdom. And he had this message about the kingdom, you see. And so his wife thought, oh, we're buying Mount Carmel so we can gather there so that the chariot can come and get us and we can go to Israel. 
Well, Ben Roden comes from Israel. He fulfills this uh, prophecy here of Amos, who was among the herdmen of the Keoa. He was a he was a shepherd's rod. He was a member of the shepherd's rod movement, and he was Brother Hadif's farmer, and he went to Israel and started a kibbutz, a vegetarian kibbutz in the, in, in in a village, in in the hills of Amarim. Now, what in the world possessed him to do that? Well, the Holy Spirit, because he was anointed of God. He was going to lead them into the kingdom. So we had a repeat of what happened in 1888. But this time we had Jones, Victor Hadoff, preparing the way, writing the bylaws, writing the provisional bylaws uh, for the movement, and preparing the money, you see, because he bought Old Mount Carmel and he sold it. Because God told him to sell it. Because it says the Lord is leading out. He's going to be the first one to sell all that he has. To buy the kingdom. That's what it says. In symbolic code number 10. First two paragraphs. Real simple. And so. The kingdom of heaven. It's the parable. Is likened unto. A man that finds a treasure. In a field. And he sells all that he has to buy the treasure. To buy the field. Now, there's another man, okay, that finds a pearl in the field. And I say it's the same field. And he sees that this pearl is priceless. But if he can buy the field, he will own the pearl. And I believe the pearl is the kingdom. Because the kingdom is really and truly the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah in our midst. See that picture there? That's the kingdom. That's true worship. That's the revival and the reformation and the reorganization. So, when we look at these, you know, simple um, chronological steps that were on time, you're looking at a blueprint of the Lord who orchestrated this whole thing of how we are going to receive the kingdom and when we're going to receive it. Do you understand this? So, these four short years, they were able, in these four short years, they were able to sell Mount Carmel, buy new Mount Carmel, and gather, what was it, 1,200 to 1,500 people here? It's not 144,000 because it wasn't supposed to be the 144,000. You don't gather the 144,000 first. You gather the wave sheep, the vanguard. And so they were here at Mount Carmel. And Brother Roden, who's a, who's, who's a member of the Shepherd's Rod Association, with a lifetime card, membership card, that Brother Hodiff gave him, and his wife. They both had a card. And it was uh, a lifetime membership. Most people get a card for uh, a year. Isn't that true? Your card, they take it back after a year because they want to see if you're still a member, if you're still in the faith, if you're still upholding the association's bylaws and doctrines. And if you're not, you're excommunicated, so to speak. You're thrown out. You're disfellowshipped. Because God only wants those that are hot, not cold or lukewarm. You understand that? So, Ben Roden had to be pretty hot because he had a lifetime membership. He was anointed. So he comes and he's, you know... Uh, the Lord is roaring from Zion through Ben Roden. He comes from Israel, Mount Zion and Jerusalem, and he comes. And he comes to the habitation of the shepherds, 
where they're mourning. You know why they were mourning on that morning? <laughs> the morning of, 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 I guess, Passover, 1959? Uh, because the chariot didn't come. Huh? Yeah, they had a disappointment. They were mourning. They were also mourning because they didn't have a president. And they realized, Sister Hadif's not the president. Sister Hadif made the wrong prediction. Sister Hadif was wrong. So was the executive council. They were wrong. So Ben Roden comes along and he says, okay, here's what you really have to do. He said that you're supposed to go sell all that you have. See, this is how you get the kingdom. You sell all that you have and you buy another field. So they were supposed to sell all of Mount Carmel, go with Ben Roden to Israel and buy another field there, which would have been the kingdom. And they didn't do it. They mocked him. Remember what happens to the fourth angel. He gets mocked, ridiculed made fun of. Victor Hadif got mocked, made fun of, by SDA, and ridiculed. Brother Roden got mocked and ridiculed by Judah and Israel. Because Ben Roden represents the tribe of Benjamin. And Judah, you see, two-tribe Judah is Benjamin and Judah. You understand this? And Benjamin... The tribe of Benjamin, the Benjamin Roden, is the smaller tribe. But it's like the lone wolf, because uh, 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 Benjamin was like a lone wolf. Okay? And he devoured the prey. Why could he devour the prey? Because he, he had the anointing. He could go in and he's devouring the sheep, the shepherds. The sheep of the shepherds. The flock. So when Ben Roden came from Israel and he pronounced, you know, the judgment, the executive phase of the judgment on Sister Hadith and the DSDA, there was a spiritual slaughter. Now, let me explain to you that the Lord, if I say the Lord roared, What roars? A lion. So the Lord, as a lion, sent Ben Roden from Israel to roar at the sheepfold here. And there was a spiritual slaughter. He devoured them. Yes, they threw him out. But what he said to them when they were throwing him out, and there were seven... Davidians that went out with him because they were Davidians at that time. He says, you just wait. I'm going to be in and you're going to be out. I'm going to be in and you're going to be out. What happened to the uh, Davidian movement? Simeon? They disbanded. They were defunct. Why? Because the Lord roared through Ben Roden. So Ben Roden, when he said, I will be in and you will be out, by 1960, he was on Mount Carmel. And he uh, instigated a lawsuit against um, Florence Hodiff and the Executive Council because they were stealing the tithe. That was second tithe property. They had no right to do that. Now, if they were going to sell it to buy the kingdom okay because that's what it was for that's what brother Hotter said it was for we're going to sell it to buy the kingdom but they didn't go to Israel that's where the kingdom was they didn't do what he told them but they did start selling the property there was 960 acres here they sold all but 77.86 acres that Ben Roden bought by auction on the courthouse steps from 
um, the lawyer that was the executor of the property. I believe his name was uh, Street. I don't remember his first name, but he was his name was Street. And he allowed Ben Roden to buy New Mount Carmel, the rest of New Mount Carmel, because he saw the pearl. He saw that God would gather together the wave sheaf at New Mount Carmel, and that it needed to be, uh, it needed to stay as God's property. And he saw that there was a pearl here, a pearl of truth. And I believe that pearl of truth was about the Holy Spirit daughter. Because that's the only way that the son realizes the kingdom. It's through his bride. Through the Shekinah. Being uh, 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 reestablished in our midst. Do you understand this? True worship, true kingdom, the true people of God. They have the Shekinah glory in their midst. The revival of the living spirit of prophecy. Because the living spirit of prophecy is the Shekinah. It's not a human beings. It's the Shekinah herself. So, we're up to 1960 now. Now, another 30 years. 30 years, because during that 30 year period, it was the investigative phase of the judgment for the living. Those that are going to be translated without seeing death. That's the living. The judgment for the dead are those that have to go through the grave to be saved. So, Ben Roden brings the message of Christ the branch, the high, high priest. Christ the anointed branch son of Elohim, God. The branch message is about a son. Branch means son in Hebrew. So, of course, he was the anointed son. And he received that anointing from the Holy Spirit when he was in Israel. He came back. And it's about our high priest finishing up the atonement. That beautiful prophecy in Zechariah about him whose name is the branch applies with peculiar force Excuse me, in the closing work of the, of the atonement. He had that message. And we all know who the branch is. It's the Lord himself. But Ben Roden took on the name, the man whose name is the branch. And he became the Joshua, or the Jesus, with the anointing of his day. Victor Hodef said that his work was likened unto that of John the Baptist. He was announcing the king coming. So his work was that of John's. It must decrease and the Lord's must increase. So when you have people that are looking at Mount Carmel and they're saying, um, what in the world happened here? You know, what in the world happened here back in 1959? Well, Florence Hodge bought the property because it was the kingdom. And it was the way to the kingdom. Because you have to sell all that you have and buy the kingdom. So Victor Hodoff sold all that he had to buy the kingdom. Florence Hodoff, you see, uh, was trying to sell all she had. But she was pocketing it because she thought they were going to be taken to the kingdom at Mount Carmel. But what they really had to do was sell Mount Carmel and go to Israel. And they didn't do it. So the Lord had to start all over again. Just like he did in 1888. He had to start all over again. They could have been in the kingdom in two years, but they didn't do it. See what I mean? So they're starting all over again. So he starts with Victor Hodov. Forty years later, there's no prophet. It's just the writings. See? Wandering in the wilderness with no one leading. That was a punishment. That was to get the uh, people... Um, so that they understand that when God says something and he wants to do something, he's going to do it and you better listen and you better do it. No messing around. So now we had 
the one that represented Jones, the second, because that angel repeats himself. See, he comes back, that angel, the Holy Spirit, repeats, 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 until it does its work. That's what we're told. Victor Hodoff has the same, a similar message to Jones's, but he elaborates on it. Sets up the kingdom, the rules of the kingdom, the whole bit. He even had his own little kingdom here. And he was showing how you have a kingdom here in Waco. You see? And then he sells that. And he knows he has to sell it before he dies. September 1954. Symbolic code. Number 10. He says we're selling everything. That means the kingdom's coming or the judgment for the living is beginning. So he's announcing it. He's saying the king's coming if the kingdom's coming. You understand what I'm saying? So he was announcing Ben Roden. And Ben Roden brings the message of the righteousness of Christ because that's what the atonement's all about. It's taking on the impartation of the righteousness of Christ. Literally. Okay? But he had the investigative phase of the truth about it. And then Lois had the judicial phase about the um, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who brings forth the righteousness of Christ when she dwells in us. You see? And so there was a an investigative phase of two the branch he and the branch she male and female. We never had that before. But we had to investigate the truth about it. And when the investigation of the truth about it came, there was an individual, the Jonah messenger, that was prophesied to come in the midst of the week, her ministry from 1977 to 1984. And he came in 1981 with a message about the daughter. And he was told to stop. Uh, remember when Jonah was thrown off the ship? Well, this Jonah messenger was thrown off the ship. Good ship Zion, the church. By the leader, the captain of the ship, Lois. And it was me. And she threw me off. Uh, basically, she disfellowshipped me. She said, don't you teach this anymore. Because she had her ideas about who the Holy Ghost in the flesh was. And human flesh was. She thought it was herself. She thought she was the daughter of the Holy Spirit mother. She had the Holy Spirit message and it would, you know, it would be reasonable what she thought. But it wasn't true wasn't true. Lois died in 1986. I brought a message in 1981 about the daughter and I was able to speak about it openly in 1984. And I showed how David Koresh, Vernon Howell, who well, he wasn't David Koresh then, uh, he was trying to usurp her position as the leader as the serpent root messenger. And he agreed to me, with me, uh, that uh, he was the one that was bringing this Luciferian movement within the Advent movement. Because God told him to do it. And I understand what he was doing. He was bringing judgment. And it was going to be the executive phase of the judgment. But first, we have to go through the judicial phase. And the judicial phase, basically, uh, was this. In 1990, six years after I gave the message, um, I went to Israel with Tom Caldwell. And it began the judicial phase. Why? Because the Lord did the very same thing that he did in 1959. Okay, the type within the uh, judgment for the dead was 
fulfilled in antitype in the judgment for the living. Does that make sense? That, you know, the dead, judgment for the dead is the prophecy, and judgment for the living is the uh, fulfillment? Okay? Now, what is it that happened? Here's what happened. And there's still confusion about it today, but I was able to uh, help the individuals that uh, were confused on this matter. And here we go. A woman by the name of Teresa Moore and other women, Ermine Sampson, were given the, uh, through Lois Roden's will, they were given the uh, duty to continue to publish her writings and Ben Roden's writings. Publish them. Okay? So, Teresa Moore assumed that because she was to further uh, uh, publish uh, Ben and Lois's writings, that she was inspired. Similar to what Florence Hodef thought. Now, if you take 1959 and you add 30 years to it, Simeon, what do you get? 1989. 1959 plus 30, because there's a 30-year overlap, right, uh, with the 6th and 7th seal, the judgment of the dead and the judgment of the living. They overlap 30 years. So the opening of the 7th seal in 1989 announcing the opening of the judgment, the judicial phase of the judgment in 1990. You understand this? So Teresa Moore went to, um, with Tom Caldwell and others, they went to Israel. They went to the Mount of Olives because they thought, she thought, the chariot was coming. But not to Mount Carmel because she thought Mount Carmel no longer had any spiritual significance. Because she thought that she was the leader of the church. The leader of the movement. Similar to what Florence Hodge thought. Kind of like a self-appointed person. But at the same time, uh, because she was the wife of uh, Victor Hodge, you would assume that she would be the one, right? Now, here's the thing. A church is represented by a woman. The priesthood is represented by a man. So, Victor Hodoff was the priest. Florence Hodoff represented the church. So when he died, she continued, but she didn't have inspiration. And we found out that she didn't have inspiration because her three and a half year prophecy didn't come true. And God had already anointed someone else. And he came from Israel to tell them. You see? He roared. He spoke. And he told them what the Lord was telling them to do. The Lord is going to lead first. He's going to be the first one to sell all that he has to buy the kingdom. So they bought Mount Carmel with that money because that's what Brother Hodef said. And then Florence Hodef said, we're going to the kingdom. Okay? Ben Roden comes and says, you got to sell all that you have. Sell Mount Carmel. Because that's what you bought it for in the first place. is so that you could gather here. Because you couldn't gather in town. It was too uh, crowded. Gather out here. Sell all that you have from here. And let's go to Israel. There's enough land there for 150,000 people. The government of Israel gave me enough land for 150,000 people. Now do you think that Ben Roden wasn't known by the Israeli government? Did you know that he's buried on the Mount of Olives and the only people that can be buried on the Mount of Olives are special people spiritual people not just anyone can be buried on the Mount of Olives they have to be accepted and allowed to be buried there by the Council of Rabbis and the government only sages and prophets spiritual leaders and men Lois is buried there too. 
she's buried with the old uh what they who they thought were prophets <clears throat> and you know there are prophets buried there too some of the prophets from the scriptures and they're there that's where they're laying in rest waiting for the lord on the mount of olives on the mount of olives Where's the Lord going to return to? The Mount of Olives. And it says when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, there's going to be a great earthquake. I believe the dead in Christ are going to rise. And those that are, of us that are alive and remain are going to be caught up. Ben Roden and Lois Roden are going to be raised from the dead. Right there. And Brother Hodder says that the feet of Christ are the prophets. Am I right? That's what he says. So when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, his prophets are going to be raised from the dead. Ben and Lois. And others, because there's that whole mountain's full of prophets. And sages. And spiritual men. In 1989, Teresa Moore uh, I don't know who the other women were, but she went with other women to be taken up because they thought they were so righteous that they were righteous enough to be taken up. Kind of like Florence. We've arrived. That's the Laodicean condition. They even She even made, um, I'm going to say ascension robes, but they weren't robes. They were priestly garments that's what they called them but they were like ascension robes and they were waiting to be taken up isn't that what happened in the history of uh, the SDA movement that they had ascension robes and they were on waiting for the Lord to come and get them isn't that true Simeon what was called the holy flesh movement well holy cow the holy flesh movement the Marichal Ella Hashbash movement that want to do everything by the flesh and think it's going to happen in the flesh. But they don't want to believe that Christ can come, that Christ the Holy Spirit can come in the flesh of a son of Adam. They don't believe that, but they believe in their holy flesh, their self-righteousness. But they don't believe that the Holy Spirit can come and anoint someone. Like Ben Roden. Why do you think he was the Joshua of his day? The Jesus. The anointed one. Because he had the Holy Spirit living in him. He came from Zion and he roared. Like the lion of the tribe of Judah. And those shepherds heard him. And those sheep. He devoured them. Because there was a slaughter. He came and ravished them. And uh. He was able to take over Mount Carmel. See what I mean? It took a little bit of time. It took a little bit of time, but he end, he ended up owning the place. Okay. Now, Teresa Moore, with Tom Caldwell and others, went to Israel, went on the Mount of Olives, and were expecting the chariot to come down. It didn't come down. Oh, well, then it must be. In the fall, let's go at atonement time. So they go at atonement time. Strike two. Strike one, strike two. We have come to the end of part one. You can continue with the video if you wish into part two.